It moves away from legalistic categories like satisfaction, which many people today find inappropriate. It moves away from the militaristic imagery of a battle. Instead, it interprets God and his salvation in terms of love. It does not separate Christ from the Father, because the love that Christ displays is God's love. Question two. It does not isolate the cross from the rest of Christ's life, because the whole of Christ's life is an example of love. Question three. But the difficulty comes with question four. If Christ has merely set us an example, does that mean we have then to follow that example by our own efforts? Has Christ objectively changed things? There is a story told of the great Scottish commander Robert the Bruce in the 13th century that illustrates this difficulty. Fighting against the invading English, he was repeatedly defeated. One day, after a severe reverse, he was sitting alone in a room, and he thought, it's no good, I must give up, no point in going on fighting. Then he looked and saw a spider that had fallen out of its web and was trying to get back again. It kept pulling itself up, by the thread on which it was hanging, and it kept falling back. But it went on trying, until at last it managed to get back into the web. Robert the Bruce uh, applied the lesson to himself. He decided to, to go and fight the English just one more time, and on this final occasion he defeated them. Now, the spider may have encouraged Robert the Bruce by setting him an example, but it did not actually change anything in his outward objective situation. So we are to ask, has Jesus on the cross done no more for us than the spider did for Robert the Bruce? Has he just set us an example but nothing more? Does he just leave us to follow his example by our own efforts, relying on our own strength? Surely that's not enough. We need his help, the help of his grace. This criticism, however, based on the story of Robert the Bruce, totally misconceives the scope and dynamism of love. Love is creative. It's not just a subjective feeling. If you love somebody with all your heart, then you change the world for them. Love is an objective energy in the universe. If a child has been loved by its parents in infancy, that will change the whole way in which he or she experiences the world later on. Because of the love of the parents, the child will have a courage, trust and hope that she or he would not otherwise have. By the same token, hatred is also an objective force. If a child has not been loved by its parents, but has been rejected, that will mark his or her life afterwards. And that child, when it grows up, will find it more difficult to trust and love others because it has not been loved itself. From this we see how love is a creative, enabling force. Our love alters the lives of others. And if this is true of our human love, it is much more true of the divine human love of Christ our Saviour. By loving us, he does not just set us an example, but he changes the world for us, giving us a meaning and hope that we could not otherwise discover. So the love of another for me infuses into me a transfiguring force, a transformative power. Love enables, just as hatred depotentiates. 
That is true of our interhuman relationships, but it is much more true of the love poured out upon us by the Son of God. Where love is concerned, the subjective-objective contrast breaks down. If we now try to join together models 3, 4 and 5, we can discover a common theme that unites them, and that is the theme of suffering love. What makes Christ's death a redeeming sacrifice is precisely that he offers himself willingly in love, Model 3. The victory of Christ is nothing else than the victory of kenotic, suffering love, Model 4. And the example of this suffering love alters our lives and fills us with grace and power. Model 5. Models 4 and 5, interpreted as we have tried to do, are simply two sides of the same coin. His victory is nothing else than the example of his unchanging love. And the example of his love is itself the victory. Joining these three models together, understanding each in the light of the other, we reach a firm and convincing doctrine of the atonement. We come now to model six, exchange. To appreciate this, my final model, we may think of Christmas. What do we do each December? We send each other greetings. We exchange presents. And that is exactly the meaning of the feast of the Incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas. When Christ was born in Bethlehem, there occurred the greatest and most wonderful of all possible exchanges. He took our humanity. Our gift to him, offered through the Blessed Virgin Mary. And in exchange, he enables us to share in his divine grace and glory. So in this sixth model, salvation is understood in terms of mutual sharing, of reciprocal participation. As St. Paul expresses it, speaking metaphorically in terms of riches and poverty. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 The riches of Christ are his heavenly glory. Our human poverty means our fallen condition, our alienation and brokenness. Christ shares in our brokenness, in our anguish, our loneliness, our loss of hope. And so we are enabled by way of exchange to share in his eternal life, becoming partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. St. Aranias of Lyon expresses the same point in more direct terms. In his unbounded love, he became what we are, so as to make us what he is. St. Athanasius of Alexandria in the 4th century is yet more succinct. He became man that we might become God. You could also translate the phrase, he became incarnate, so that we might be in God it, or he was humanized that we might be deified. This sixth model encourages us to think of salvation as theosis, or deification. Salvation is not just a change in our legal status before God. It is not just an imitation of Jesus through moral effort but it signifies an organic, 
all-embracing transformation of our created personhood through a genuine participation in divine life. Equally, this sixth model can be spelt out in terms of healing. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, also in the 4th century, or Gregory the Theologian, as he's known in the Orthodox Church, affirmed, with reference to the Incarnation, the unassumed is unhealed. Christ, that is to say, has shared totally in our humanness. He has taken up into himself our human nature in its entirety, and in this way he has healed us and transfigured us. This sixth model presupposes a change in us. Question one. It also presupposes a change in the second person of the Trinity, in the sense that by becoming incarnate, while Christ has not ceased to be true God, he has also become truly human. The sixth model holds closely together Christ and the Father, question two. Also, and most importantly, it treats Christ's economy as a single unity, question three. Incarnation, Transfiguration, Gethsemane, Golgotha, the Resurrection, the Ascension are all seen as essentially connected, and it is fully objective, question four. As I insisted at the beginning, my six models are not mutually exclusive. We are to make use of all of them. Equally, my list of six is not exhaustive. I am sure that you can find other models in the New Testament. There are other aspects of the Christian doctrine of salvation that I have not mentioned tonight. In particular, salvation is not solitary but social. We are saved in the Church as members of it and in union with all the other members. We are saved more specifically through the sacraments of the Church, above all baptism and Holy Communion. This will be the subject of future addresses by others in this present series. It remains for me to tell you how I replied to the man in the train when he asked me, Are you saved? I might have answered, yes, I am saved. But might that not have been somewhat overconfident? Long after his conversion on the road to Damascus, St. Paul expressed the fear that, after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. 1 Corinthians 9.27 God is faithful, and he will not change. But we humans, as long as we are in this life, retain free will, and so up to the end of our life we are in danger of falling away. As St. Anthony of Egypt, the father of monasticism, living in the fourth century, warned us, Expect temptation until your last breath. I am on a journey, and that journey is not yet completed. So, perhaps I should have answered the man, No, I am not saved. But that doesn't seem very satisfactory. He could have replied, Well, what do you mean by going about dressed in black like this? If you're not saved, you've no business to be a clergyman. Possibly then I should have answered, I don't know. 
but that is surely a very feeble answer. He could well have responded, if you don't know, you'd better go and find out. Thus, I thought, the best way of answering was to say, I trust, by God's mercy, I am being saved. In other words, let us use the present tense, but in the form of the continuous present. Not, I am saved, but I am being saved. Salvation, that is to say, is a process. It is not just a single event, but an ongoing journey, a pilgrimage that is only completed at the moment of our death. So that was my answer to the man in the train. But if you can think of a better answer, please let me know. Oh.